Tom, did you want to say something to start with? Uh, no, no, you can start like the last time. But I'll, after we finish, I have to tell him what tomorrow. Uh -huh. Okay, so you'll do that afterwards. I have all the votes. Yeah, so okay. So you, you're on the panel too. So you're here. Okay, but I'll think of watches from here, then I'll see when we finish, okay? Because okay. Otherwise, I cannot see that. Yep. Hello, welcome to Skype call testing service. After the beep, please record a message. Your message will be played back to you. Hello, Oscar. We're Hello. Larry Bergen. The audience is here. So this is the this is the audience. So Hello. So, somewhere there. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Test. Yes. Okay. Yes. I have a little noise, but I, I, I can hear you. Okay. We we are also in a very little office, but we are a big audience. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we've been going now four days nonstop doing different mm. type of space time, spatial space time analysis visualization. So people are getting a bit tired already, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but we are really looking forward to your webinar. Mm -hmm. And just to tell you, we had already one webinar on Tuesday uh, by uh, Jonathan Greenberg. And that mm -hmm. went very well. We had a very good discussion. The line was very good, and mm -hmm. so I'm, and that's why I'm also confident that, that we will have a interesting discussions with you. And we have your book also here, so it <laughs> will, will be going around. <laughs> Thank you. So we will send your book around. So I don't want to steal you uh, much more time. So please, uh, we will be looking at your slides. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you finish, uh, we will have a discussion. We will ask you some questions, and then we can discuss all together. Okay? Good. So uh, you have 40 minutes, or? Well, we're all, all together. We'll all together. That's, that's perfect. You've got about five minutes. Then uh, there's, there's about f five, seven minutes for you. Then um, Truck is going to say something about D3. Okay. And then we'll open a discussion. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, I, truck slides are the ones that I sent you, or PowerPoint that I sent you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so that, okay. that's the way we'll do it. I don't think you can see the. So I can I can point this at the at the mm -hmm. at the displays so that you can see more or less where we are. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll move the slides when you're ready to move the slides. Everybody can see your face. You okay. can't see them, but you can see the slides <laughs> well. You, you, you yes. Can, the camera doesn't turn around. Okay. Okay. So, we're interested to hear what you have to say. Good. Well, we are, we are going to talk a little about the visualization of raster data with uh, raster bees. Next, next slide, please. Good. Okay, some, some words about uh, the background, about me and about the, the background of raster bees. Well, I, I, I have been working during the past 15 years mainly in solar energy systems, with an special interest in solar radiation. With this, the, the subject which, uh, is uh, with I am involved more. I have developed some, some packages about this area of expertise, solar radiation, and uh, other things that are funny for, for me. For example, I have developed a, a solar package, which is useful for solar radiation and performance of photovoltaic system, raster bees, which we are going to talk a little, and uh, meteor forecast, for example, which is a, a package for, for prediction, for numerical weather prediction uh, service. 
Well, the, the origins of, of raster beast. I started the raster beast with uh, Robert, with Robert Hitman, a few years ago, because I was involved in a in a project in an analysis of solar radiation, uh, missing satellite satellite data from the uh, CMSAS service and uh, ground measurements from the CL network. The CMSAF data is a raster stack with more than 700 layers of daily radiation, and the data from the CL network is a set of 300 time series, one for each station, also with more than 700 records. So what I needed was uh, methods to display this spatial-temporal raster data and combine it easily with, with better data, with two main objectives. First, to understand the data, and second, because there was a paper in, involved, to communicate the, the results. Therefore, now the raster beam package is a complement to the raster package, which provides a set of methods for visualization. There are four groups of, of methods. The, um, the first group is the, the classical way of uh, displaying raster data, which is uh, level and contour plots. Uh, there is a second, uh, second group, which is related to the exploratory data analysis framework, scatter plots, histogram, and so on. The third group, which is uh, very important, at least, at least for, my, for my research, that is uh, the group uh, devoted to a spatial temporal raster. There are methods for homolar diagrams, horizon graphs, tensor plots, but well, we, we will talk about it later. And the last uh, group is a method to display vector files using arrows or streamlines. Some words about the design issues of, uh, of RasterBase. RasterBase is based on grid and lattice. In, in there, there are two main uh, ways of displaying graphics, traditional or, or base graphic and grid graphics. Uh, the, the main difference with both of them is that traditional uh, produce an output, a graphical output, but does not give uh, an object that can be modified later. In contrast, grid graphics, the grid package, produce the graphical output and also uh, gives a, a, an object that can be modified using the, the classical methods in, in there. Therefore, the grid package is a toolbox that provides flexibility to modify or add content and to combine different different outputs easily. Lattice, well, the raster bit is based also in Lattice. Lattice is based on, on Greece. And the Lattice package is an implementation of the trellis framework, which is more or less a rectangular array of panels. The structure of these array of panels is the, defined using a formula, a formula interface, that defines the, the, the specification of the variables involved in the, in the plot. This structure is somewhat uh, rigid, and here is where the lattice straight extra package is, is very useful because it uh, implements layers and superposition of, of layers with trellis objects, which is more or less the way that ddplot uh, works. Well, let's see some, some examples about. Um, sorry, I forgot to, to, to tell you when to change, Roger. So far, so far. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> well, we, we are we are working well. Okay, so some some samples about uh, the functionalities of of raster bits. Mm. The the classical way of, of displaying uh, raster data is uh, with level plots. Mm. Here is uh, an example with uh, a multi-layer raster stack. It display which is uh, a panel for each, each layer, OK? Uh, what you are seeing here is uh, solar radiation, our average, uh, sorry, monthly average of solar radiation. Each uh, panel corresponds to a layer of monthly, of monthly radiation. So you can see in one, in one view the relation with the, the, whole, the whole year, OK? Next, next slide, please. You can uh, choose only uh, one layer. For example, here we are uh, choosing the April radiation. And we can superpose another, uh, another kind of data. For example, the location of the measurement stations. We are using uh, the layer mechanism implemented by Lattice Strat, uh, Lattice Extra, with uh, the graphical methods implemented in the ESP package, ESP points. OK? Next. 
Okay. Another way, and a different approach, is to plot uh, the individual layers of the space-time raster, secondly, as a movie, using each, uh, each layer as a frame of a, of a movie. The procedure is, is, is extremely simple. The key is to use the layout um, argument of level plot. With layout, we define the structure of panels in one page. Here we are saying that we want one column and one row in each page. So each layer occupies one page. One page is one frame. So with this combination of trellis device, level plot and layout, we are producing one uh, file for each frame. The next step is to pass, uh, to pass together all the frames with uh, an application, for example, FMMPIG. Okay. If you click on, on this on this link, the movie should start. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's, it's not. So the, what, what we'll do is provide. It's not on this machine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, it's perfect. We don't have control of the control machine. We yeah. Mm -hmm. from that. So we just mm -hmm. don't have the right okay. to do that. But, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a problem. I've, I've seen it and it's impressive. Mm -hmm. When you get to see it, then, then, then it's, it's fun. It shows what, what, what it's the, this, this movie is also available in the website of the, of the book that Tom showed you later. So, well, we talk about it, it later. Well, um, well, in... in in level plot, in, sorry, in raster piece, there are some uh, default uh, themes, some default uh, color palettes implemented by default, which is the, the one you have uh, been seeing in, in, in previous frames, in previous slides. But you can define your own palette of color, which is uh, quite simple with the raster theme uh, function. Here we are choosing a sequential panel with, uh, with blues using the color space uh, package. OK, next, please. There are a different uh, kind of uh, raster data. We have seen, been seeing uh, the quantitative uh, raster data, but you may be interested in categorical data. Well, the, in level plot, there is a method implemented to display categorical uh, data in a correct way, which is this, for example, is a, a land classification raster data, which is showing where is the snow, the urban areas, land, forests, etc. Next, please. Well, if we want to analyze the, the relation between variables, between layers of a, of a raster stack or a raster brick, uh, we have to use another tools. For example, the, the scatter plot. Here we are displaying the relation between the solar radiation in January and February. We, you can distinguish both of them with uh, the color versus the radiation in July for uh, four different groups of uh, longitude, or longitude area. Each panel in this, in this graphic is a different area delimited by, by longitude. Because of the, of the cloud in, in January and February, you can see there is a non-linear relation between the uh, radiation in winter, for example, and, and summer. Next, please. If you don't know exactly which uh, variables you need to, to compare, you can compare both of them, all of them in one, in one call. Here is with the scatter plot matrix is, is useful, implemented in the, in, the splum, in the splum method. Here you are uh, seeing all the relation between the, the, the layers in this raster stack. It's, it's an element in the principal diagon diagonal is the uh, each month of the, of the raster stack, and in the rest of the cells, you can see the relation between the radiation in different in different modes. This method plum is implemented using an, another package, spin plot, which is very useful when you have a lot of that. Uh, you are not displaying each each point each, each point itself, but uh, you are counting which uh, number of points uh, falls in a determined uh, determined area. Yes, please. Well, another tool is the, the classical histogram. Here, once again, each panel is a, is a mount, a layer of the raster stack. 
And you can appreciate the difference in the behavior of solar radiation across the, across the year. For example, in July, uh, the, the, the main uh, radiation is in the high level, high level values. And in January or December, there are, well, a variety, but is uh, centered in the, in the low value of, of radiation. Next, please. Well, a, a different approach is to um, to collapse the one of the two spatial dimensions of the of the raster stack using a, a appropriate, an appropriate statistic. For example, the the mean or the or the standard deviation or whatever you you find useful. Uh, therefore, you produce an, an space space time uh, plot or also known as a home order diagram, which is what you are seeing now. Uh, one of the axes, the vertical axis, is uh, representing time, and the horizontal uh, horizontal axis is representing the the latitude in this in this case. So each uh, cell, each each area in this in this plot is representing the average radiation, for example, in 40 degrees of uh, latitude for each year. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this graphic, I am using a different data set. Uh, this is the anomalies of uh, surface, uh, surface sea temperature. So you can see in the, in the ledger that this uh, range from negative values to positive values. I am using here blue for positive values, red for, for negative values. So you can identify in which years and in which area of, of, of the raster uh, there were positive values, there were values about the, the average, the long-term average, and when there were values below the long-term average. Next, please. This same approach to collapse uh, one of the spatial dimensions and represent this uh, aggregated uh, result versus the time is uh, useful for the horizon, horizon graph, which is this, gra this graphic. Here, we are displaying many time series, cutting the vertical, the vertical range into segments, and overplotting them with color, representing the magnitude and direction of deviation. So each time series, again, correspond to a geographical zone, which, uh, for example, a, 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 latitude, a latitude band. Once again, you can identify the the different, the different behavior of surface sea temperature in, in different regions and different years. Next, please. Well, the last group of, um, of methods, of graphical methods, are devoted to vector files. Here, we, what we need for a visualization method for displaying vector, vector file is to display both the magnitude and the direction of the vectors of, of, at that point. The most common way is uh, to use arrows, which, uh, uh, well, it draws a small arrow at uh, discrete points with, uh, with a size related to the, uh, to the magnitude and direction, well, the direction of the arrow. This approach is huge for small data sets because if the, this, the, the width is uh, too dense, well, the, the, mines, the, the image tend to be visually confusing. So a different approach, next slide, please, is to use um, flow lines or streamlines. Here, we, we, the, the, the approach is to, the, the, to display the directional structure of the vector fly, uh, file with its integral curves. Here, with, uh, there are a lot of points in a discrete grid for each point, a short streamlined uh, portion, a local streamlined, is calculated integrating the, the underlying vector file at this, at this point. So the color of each streamlet indicates the local vector magnitude, and once again, the direction of that, uh, that streamlet uh, is related to the direction of the vector file of, at, this, at this local area. OK. Well, if you need more, pues, uh, well, there are two, two main resources. First, about all, the, the web page. And please don't forget the, the, the facts section. 
And as Tom has told you about, I have a book which is named this Plain Time Series, Spatial and Space Time Data with Wither, which includes four chapters uh, related to raster data. There is a website when you can, where you can access freely to the data sets using in the sample and the full R code, which is this URL we you have in the in the slide. Okay, I, I have no more to do to say now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, this the, the, the audience here. Now we're going to sort of switch around because uh, the, the, before we go to discussion, uh, unless you'd like to, to start the discussion straight away, I think it would be helpful to take Chuck's talk about, to, again, a short talk about D3, which is a, mm -hmm. a, a different approach to doing things. So if we do that straight away, then we have two different views on the way in which things can be done, one from within R and the other one in the, from elsewhere. And I have the Chuck's presentation here. So, for you, I'll, you uh, um, Oscar has a copy of Chuck's yes. presentation. So, so that you can yes. It, but we, we have to tell you when to change the slides now, not you tell us. <laughs> OK. Um, every day we have a great amount of data from different sources. So we collection a lot of the data. We do a lot, go through a very complex process, like analyze, predictive, report, advice, uh, which involve a lot of people like statistician, programmer, um, journalist, and a lot of people. And what we produce uh, is public report, statistician, and council. Um, okay. Okay, now it's okay. So, so I can go. Slide three now. Oh, wonderful. Okay. The more interesting thing is that I want to show you. It, uh, that's wonderful. This application, which I have made, let me. You can read through this uh, PDF, but this is more important. That's, uh, for example, we have uh, made uh, some application we call Hublin. And uh, uh, yeah, we have a last slide. And the, uh, we use only R and HTML and JavaScript in order to do the, 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 the application. Let me sh show you. Uh, let's see. This is, is the genetic analysis. I want to show you how we use the, the uh, parallel computing. Okay, if I choose between one and 10, and I click on run snip, and right away we, you will see the difference of starting working in PID, the processing ID. And you can see they're on the fly. And can, we can have one million, two million, let the machine go. And they, first, they start taking the order your processor. They, they go very quickly. Oh. Oh. Let me start again, and I open this one for you. In order to prove that. Voila. You see how the PID is working. And then you see here. On the screen, they all increase consistently. And you can even stop it and redo it to the website. <coughs> so everybody can download it. You all can go to this address, download it, play around, and then you can make some application according to your needs.
the wires. I want to show you some kind of the. So the, some examples are coming of live use of these tools. So yeah. the, the, uh, Oscar, you're looking at the picture on the screen of the use of these rings. And uh, the last one, this one. Uh, if you have uh, produced a lot of K-mail and you want to publish on the web for the public and for your department, you can download this one. This is the framework. All you need to do is uh, change the name, like, for example, here. You have a man. Oh, okay. If you have a man category environment data and then you have a different K-mail, let's see, I push on the the traffic pollution in uh, Hodelon, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Bergen. And you can even zoom in, and you can put in many layers like this one. Oh. Well. And this is, this is using B, B3 uh, you JavaScript? See? Yes, yes, we use uh, only JavaScript and KML, broad KML from. Uh, so. so all you need to do is download, it's a free, free component. So just download it and playing around. They ha but they are in Danish. You've got to translate it into the English. So this is a very good tip for you in case you want to publish your work. Uh, otherwise, we can do some kind of, this is the uh, different of disease, let's say asthma from a different hospital in Norway. Uh, what we can do is, let's say, here you have the years, you have the number, you have uh, the sex. One is for the boy, two is for the girl, for example. If you want to focus on 1995 to 2005, you see all oh, they been automatic aggregated. And then you want to choose uh, those who have a 50%, right? And you want to see the boy, for example. So, so you can- this, this was why you wanted to show it live because see things happening in yeah, yeah. the dynamic visualization which yeah, is quite yeah. fast because the feature of b3 yeah. is it's generous dynamic yeah. visualization which the user can interpret so you don't need to go to the server to do a lot of aggregate everything happened in the client side yeah. and the since side the, yeah in clear so uh, you can make the same thing for your department which can public in one just so you don't need one for your surveillance system in your company and then one for the public. All you need to filter out which data you should publish. And another example is like example like this one. I have a, a lot of uh, this is from the birth registry. The birth registry. I have lots. If I want to choose the those who have between twenty and twenty two, for example, and you see those area there's only one area. And I want to see a little more. And I want you to see, okay, those who have most preeclampsia, there is only one area that has preeclampsia. So you see, all you need to do is, it's very dynamic. All you need to do is a file and then a map, and then you can go from year to years. And they do, do all the aggregated data for you. Uh, so how do you, how do you generate this data? It's a text file, normally it's a CSV file. You don't need JSON or uh, yeah. You don't need a JSON. I, I use a CSV. So is it faster migrating into CMD or a different template? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, different template. Yeah. No. Okay, let's see how many movement taking full at full later under prevention, uh, under pregnancy, and how many take a full at before the pregnancy. Okay, if you want to take under B, the pregnancy. So I can, wait. <laughs> I've got the wires now. You can't have the wires with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Same thing like that. Huh? I take uh, one like this. So the, 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 so the, the contrast, Oscar, is between your work, which is for graphic and publication purposes principally, and what Brooke is talking about is, is dynamic interactive use of graphics. And you will so see you here. Two subsets on screen. And also to run something similar to your video, which we couldn't show because we didn't have the software.
now you're choosing different years, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Can you could use from year to year? So but it's a bit slow. Yeah. Just work you know, quickly with it. Yeah. But the point is, you can go from years to years. Uh, very dynamic. So all you need. Yes, yes, we can, we can have a group of map at any point. <coughs> uh, uh, the, the cause of that is quite a huge amount of data sitting in 1950 to 2010. Let's see how many people have died of AIDS. Okay, I choose like this one. And here on the right side, you see the women, the men, you see the AIDS. You can put as many variables as you want to. Let's see, I just want to put specific women and they that age. You know, everything is automatic up to the day. So uh, it's quite very powerful, and you can handle a very huge amount of data. And this you have seen that. Have you seen that before? Uh, I mean, can you do, do, do those things like twice? No. How? Yeah, week today, yeah. week today of the week, we was most uh, 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 the women give the most birth. Just, ju it's just for fun. Well, this is this is in in Norwegian. Norwegian. Yeah. Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday. Yeah. So these aren't we're not randomizing days of the week in different orders because yeah. there's the the first the first <coughs> the left hand column yeah. is the column with the most births. Yeah. So it's almost not never at the weekend because at the weekend we have to pay overtime. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> the more amazing thing is. Do you know how many family names is there here in Norway? In the US, you have 150,000 family names. It's about for 350,000 uh, million people. In Norway, you have 5 million. And we have uh, 860,000 family names in Norway. <laughs> OK, let me uh, make so some. Choose, choose a family. Okay, well, where, choose. Do they, where do they live? OK, let's see. Choose you never see that it's wrong, don't take the family. <laughs> So uh, it's average. It's no, it's uh, at the moment, it's, 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 it, it makes the data messy to, to pick how many names get aggregated. So you pick the mother's <laughs> family name, the father's <laughs> family name. You get lots of combinations. You don't get n family names. You get n, n squared family names. Mm. OK, I want to see all of the family of Kona, where they where they live in. Well, it's an Irish name. Yeah, yes. I'm so trying, well, trying to find some yes, Irish. Are you found them? Yeah. And so you can zoom in. It's Trondheim. You have well, a two. somebody. There's some, somebody out there on the coast as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, dear Connor. Yeah. Yeah. This is. But if you try Olsen, will there be. Oh, yes. Olsen is more funny. I use R in order to. But so the straight. No, uh, there are what? There, there, uh, Olsen. Almost 100,000 Olsen. Yeah. And mostly. Uh, they're, they're in the big city. In the uh, big city, and except from two municipal, which don't have it, is it? Okay, okay. <laughs> so we know the city also. The one the left, uh, that's Oslo. Oslo. That's right. So okay, so <coughs> there are lots of Oslo's in Oslo simply because it's the city. Are you good? So yeah. the, 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 the point that you're making is that, that these, yes, these these references things. can give us completely different insights in how to do dynamic visualization. If mm. we try and make R do it, it can be hard work. Mm -hmm. R is very good for putting something which is pro pro um, publication quality or can be used for exploring the data. But dynamic D3 is, is, is quite powerful. And okay. you can also copy data. Let, let me, for, for example, I, I have uh, some case, some variable. Yeah, and you can choose the location between commune institution from year to year, and you can join what kind of cluster you want to run, and then voila. You know, skip probability map, poison probability map. And we use this exactly the same technique as we use from the hub data. Which you can visit and try it. Yeah, you can visit and try it. But, but that if, if you want to do things on Hapling, then you need to know that the, the method. Yeah, of course. Like but I mean, for the, for the code uh, yeah. and for the parallel computing. How okay, to use. good. So, and yes, that's great. Uh, Thank you. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> no, I need this back.
So, um, we are back to the panel discussion. Um, I'm going to first, can you still hear us? Oh, Tom, I have I have some problems to understand you when when you use I don't know if the problem is with the microphone or with my network, but I I I, I hear your voice broken. Okay, uh, you 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 will tell us. We are going to ask now for questions, and okay. uh, you will tell us if you have problems. Then we might have to repeat. Okay. 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 So first of all, let's see the questions from the audience. Or questions or comments. Have you been exposed to the uh, D3, uh, the J, JS test of Java or JavaScript? Yeah, D3 JavaScript. Have you been exposed? Have you used it? No? Oscar, what about you? No. Okay. I, ha I have tried, but it's, it's, it's a different length. Uh, yeah, I, I played a bit with D3, and because I, I, in an earlier incarnation of myself, I used a, a simpler thing for for drawing dynamic charts in R, um, in on the web. Um, there was a, a little package called Flot, which is great for doing little JavaScript charts. And D3 came out, and everyone was going, D3 is really cool, really cool, and. They were making really nice visualizations with D3. Um, uh, and I tried to get my head around the D3 way of doing things. And it's almost like it's going from base graphics to ggplot. You know, you, you, it's a different grammar of how the data drives the visualization. So it takes a bit of thinking, getting around. And every time I think I want to make a new visualization on the web, I, I think, let's try and do this in D3. And I get stuck and end up going back to doing it in flot or something. So. It's it's kind of hard, but there are yeah there are nice nice maps and things you can do now. Um, if I could get my network working, I'd I'd get the D3 demo up. I'm I'm sure we could just click on that D3JS.org and everyone would go wow with all the demos. But uh, um, it it's one one thing about it is that a lot of it is reinventing stuff that's been around a long while. All these these linked plots where you can brush on one plot and show a histogram update. I saw that done 20 something years ago by a guy called John Hazlitt at, I think he was at Trinity, Dublin. His, he was one of the first people to look at link plots and have a nice interface that only ran on a Macintosh. Um, and also there's GGOBY. Have you seen GGOBY? Yeah, okay, that, well that's a, um, a standalone package for doing linked visualizations just like you've got, but obviously as a standalone application, not on the web. Um, and doing them on the web is a lot easier, it doesn't require an install. But there's an RG Gobi package where you can just take a data frame and do RG Gobi of my data frame and have histograms and scatter plots and 3D tours. Yeah. Yeah, th there's also... Um, there's also lots of higher dimensional applications, all sorts of visualization applications out there, right? especially in the sort of four dimensional slicing of, of blocks, where you can take a, a three dimensional raster and look at slices through it at various angles. All the, the sort of finite element modelers and climate modelers are, are looking at you know, a, a weather model and taking a slice through it and horizontally and vertically and, and sort of 3D WYSI stuff. So there's a lot of good stuff out there. That's just my. Uh, my thoughts. Can, can I ask Oscar a question? Can I ask yes. you a question, Oscar? Yes, yes, uh, of course. So the question is, uh, is the fact that as your book is on uh, um, time series, spatial, temporal, and spatial, but obviously yeah. books are very difficult medium. It's a very difficult medium to uh, describe uh, dynamic graphics. Yes. So would you have? If you did a film of the book, would it include dynamic graphics? Because you, you, the, the file you sent, we tried to get it running. I've got it running on, on Linux on my laptop, but I can't use that when my laptop's running Windows to show you on Skype. So, so the, the, I, uh, I could wave, wave the, the USB stick around, but people wouldn't see mm -hmm. it. But, but you're doing dynamic graphics, but yeah. it's difficult to show in a book, right? 
Yes, yes. Do, do you work with dynamic graphics yourself? Yes, there are some sections in the book dealing with dynamic graphics, with animation and, and so on. I have been using a different approach with this, using the another package from Paul Morrick, which is the creator of, of Grid, which is the package Grid SVG, which is devoted to create SVG graphics, which can be interactive and uh, include animation and, and so on. So in the book, I have included code and some details about how to, to create animation and interactive graphics and they are included in the in the website, and in the website, okay. they are working correctly. Even the the movie the, the movie I sent you yesterday is is working, can be seen because I am using the Vimeo service to to host the uh, the movie. But it's it's a personal preference. I I feel more comfortable with the static graphics that we in, with animation and and dynamic graphic, but it's a personal. A personal preference. Uh, I have been trying to, to learn D3 and JavaScript, that is it's another language. I, I don't have time to to learn another language. This is my, my limitation. So I have tried with the read SVG package and also with the Signy, with the Signy package and the, in the Signy server. It is a different, a different approach because everything you have to, to do, uh, you are making with, with R. You don't have to, to learn a, a different language. But as I said, it's a, a personal preference or a personal limitation, I, I am not sure. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, what you said that the, um, there was a bit of competition uh, between Oscar and this uh, D3 uh, graphics, but I see that Oscar has lots of original plots. I mean, I, you know, I never saw this. Uh, uh, side uh, sidebars and uh, um, you know s splitting things in one dimension or um, combining a, you know you have a, a spatial dimension and then you have some um, time dimension or you have a time dimension and you have some uh, parameter so I think there's many many things that I see in Oscar books are actually quite original um, I on the other hand I see that with this uh, D3 it's interactive graphics, but if you take a snapshot, if you take a snapshot, you basically, you basically get a static. So I, I think it's uh, it's it's simple enough. Like with the with my plot KML, I mean, it's uh, if you take a snapshot of okay, first you have to deal with all these copyright issues and things, uh, but it's, it's it will never be the same. I mean, if you just do a snapshot, you know, it's just uh, it has to be, you have to uh, simplify it. You have to convert it into more simple symbols. Uh, because actually the the best graphics is the one which is simplified enough uh, to to be able to convey a message very quickly and um, you know when I read it uh, like a journal like economist and you know this this uh, trends and plots in economists they look very trivial they look very simple but but if you know that there's a whole science why they're simple you know people could write book books about why do, why do they make it yeah and so, uh, so when I when I want to learn really graphical expressions and graphical design, I I, I try to look for uh, uh, cases like where there's extremely well, uh, extremely good effect of uh, somebody communicating some uh, trend or pattern, and and so and that's where you want to get. I have a question for you, Oscar. Yes. Uh, we had here. Uh, they, are, they, they left now, so we can talk against them. Uh, there was uh, Edzer Pebesma from uh, Munster, from the uh, Institute of Geoinformatics, and there was uh, Robert Hymans here, and they left both today. And, and there was a, they were giving sessions, I think, one after the other. And, and so you know one, one made the raster package, and mm -hmm. the other is one of the main authors of the SP package, together with uh, Roger. And so they made these uh, parallel classes. There's a parallel class for raster data. So there was spatial grid, spatial pixels, and then there was the raster raster class. And mm -hmm. I see you decided to make a package that is a raster viz. And so uh, why did you decide to make a raster viz and not, uh, for example, SPVs? Sorry, so the last word. I, I didn't understand the last word. Uh, so you made a package raster viz. Yes. So yeah. You kind of align yourself to the raster class, 
Mm -hmm. and I wonder if there's some special reason for that. So, so, um, um, so why raster is not? Why not have SPVs? Why did you yeah. go that? Why did you follow that mm -hmm. path? Well, the, the relation with this is rather simple. I, I was working with uh, raster data three years ago. The methods that were included in the raster package were not enough for me, so I, I needed more. In contrast, in the ESP package, there were graphical methods implemented that work perfectly for, for my needs. So uh, I, I, I didn't need any, any, any additional uh, improvement to, to the package. My hope was that you're going to say that, I, that you prefer uh, one or the other class, but your diplomat uh, your answer was very diplomatic. So it's no, <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I am not a computer engineer. I'm a photovoltaic engineer, so uh, I don't have a special preference for for that kind of things. I feel feel comfortable with with both classes, but I needed more graphical methods. That's the reason of, of Rasterbees. Okay. Um, I have one more question for you, um, and that's about the uh, cartography. Uh, many people ask me, beginners, and, and we have lots of people here, for example, who are, um, let's say, experts in their field, but they are only recently exposed to uh, R and, and then the packages and the developments in R. And then typically what people ask me, you know, should I be making maps in R? Should I be making, like, maps that go into a a book on a publication. So mm -hmm. uh, displaying geographical patterns, geographical data. Should I be doing that in R or should I just use a, a open source GIS like QGIS or should I you know, do things by hand? Mm -hmm. uh, so because in, in R you will have to make the code for everything you want, even if you want a scale bar, if you want a legend, you mm -hmm. will have to make a code. So what, what would you say to these people? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's again a matter of, uh, of personal preference. I feel more comfortable with her by the simple reason that, uh, well, I, I have a little memory, I have a weak memory, so I need to remember what I'm doing. So if everything is writing, is in code, I'm sure that I will remember what I have done. And this is not possible in, in, with, in problem with graphical interfaces or, or, or so on. Uh, I have been working with, with her for, I, I don't know, 10 years or 8 years, more or less. And there, there, uh, it has a lot of uh, limitations, but, uh, well, I, I have been surviving with, with, with it, with, uh, with the, the, the packages and the classes that are already defined. So, well, I, I feel comfortable, and I have been working with uh, spatial data for five years or three years, and I don't have the need to, to change for a different program. Okay. Any questions from the audience? No? Is anyone using Rasterviz maybe? Have you used Rasterviz? Okay. <laughs> I'll just show you there. Okay, note with your heads, please. Oh. No. <laughs> yeah. So there are people using Rasterviz, yeah. Okay. There might be some more, yes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, are we going to close the session? Ah, there's a question, sorry. Hello, uh, my name is Baiman. Uh, the question I think is uh, to you and the other developers of several ARA packages. I have been using ARA not maybe five years now. I have seen good packages come and some of them they fall out they say it's no longer supported. What are your plans for your packages that you have now? What happens after you are tired, you say, I, don't, I do no longer want to support it? Oscar, did you get that question or should we repeat? No, no, I could understand it very well. Okay. Did you can summary? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, could be, could be by you. Right. So oh. the the question is what happens with the packages when maintainer gets 
mm-hmm. not sick, but let's say decides to change career. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what, what happens with all this user community? Mm-hmm. Well, um, there is a, a mechanism uh, that is the, the, that package becomes orphan and any, anyone in the community can adopt it to, uh, to continue the development. Uh, in this moment, I have two packages uh, that I am using that uh, have become orphan in the past, and likely they have been adopted by, by another developer. So I have had no problem with, uh, with that. But there is another solution that is, uh, well, if this package is orphan and nobody is willing to, 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 to follow the, the development, well, you can uh, you can uh, sorry get the, the code and use the code you are you, you need for your for your own package. Okay, uh, is that a good answer? You want to comment? Would you like to comment? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I. Um, I, I think there was a uh, some worry about the GDAL, Google. There was a worry about the Google that when the Frank Warnedam w- went to Google, right? Everybody, the whole community was really worried that who's going to maintain it and what's going to happen. Yeah. With regard to Google, then the uh, the the the, um, the prime mover for quite a lot of of the software that we use, the underlying software that we use, is, is Frank Warmerdam. And he lived in a cabin somewhere in the woods in Canada for a long time and just did um, development. Uh, is that, so he, what, what, he was a freelance developer and companies paid him to do things which he incorporated into free software. Uh, but then he was recruited by Google because he's good at doing what he does now. Then he went to Skybox, and now Skybox is being bought by Google. So we don't really know what what will happen to Frank, but uh, uh, the Google uh, development at the moment is being driven by, is his name Evan Rouen? Did he he come to Nottingham, Barry? Uh, Evan, but uh, it's presumably a French name. Uh, But uh, uh, Barry was, was the organizer you were the local. You you were on the committee of the of the uh, Phosphor G uh, conference in Nottingham, where there were 800 uh, present. So that there are a lot of people who are interested in doing things, uh, but the, what they're interested in doing is quite divergent. Uh, so that provided there's a community, then and if there are needs for software to survive, it probably will survive. But I think it's helpful to think of it as an ecosystem. So if it doesn't survive, then obviously somebody ate it. <coughs> and, and with regard to with regard to your work, then you're working, uh, Tom. Then you're working on um, on soil mapping, soil databases. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that because you have to visualize that as well. But but you're talking about if if the the danger that something will come orphaned or abandoned or. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if you, I, I will see it like th- there are things that become orphan, but uh, the problem is, is something become orphan if if there's a big community, a big dependency. So then, then you really have a problem. I mean, if you have, like on our, I mean, you have like five thousand packages, but they follow some kind of a Parsonic distribution, so there's only like. I don't know, 20 that really have a lot of dependencies and then maybe 80% has no dependencies. So for the 80% of packages, if they will uh, kind of shut down or stop, I mean, it's uh, the community wouldn't feel it. But if there is a package which has a high dependency and then and something happens and there's no maintenance anymore, uh, yeah, that that is a serious problem, and uh, I think what what Oscar said. Then you really have to look for some mechanisms that you you transfer, you transfer the package, or or at least if it's in open source, as far as I understand, it's a it's a, it's okay to take that code and adopt it, as long as you attribute the author. Mm-hmm. So I think 
I think that's certainly one way that things then might uh, continue developing. But uh, yeah, sure. I, I think for me the best example is uh, with the Goodall, uh, where you have a, basically one person uh, made this brilliant uh, software and um, I, don't, I don't think that happens in uh, computer science so often that somebody makes such a brilliant software and it covers so many things and then you're really dependent on one person but uh, as you said uh, uh, luckily there's a other people behind him now that they're going to continue the legacy so um, so yeah that's my say on that hmm. okay um, do we have any more questions or comments Joining us. Uh, Thank you. Uh, as, as you can see, there's a good group here. Uh, after four days, as Tom said, then everybody's uh, <laughs> fa fairly, they're fairly, <laughs> fairly saturated, uh, so that they've uh, they've been working hard. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, your book is, is sort of. Uh, I, I'd like to get it back, by the way. It's, yep. it's, it's gone somewhere in the room, so it, it's being looked at. If I get it back tomorrow afternoon, that's fine. So <laughs> just pass it around to anybody. It's, 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 it's only got halfway th across the room, so the other half of the room has a good chance to look at it. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I guess you'll fi get some interesting questions from the people here about how okay. to present things. Uh, and, okay. And I've already men I mentioned your uh, blog on, uh, on Monday when, uh, when I began. Mm. Uh, okay. Because it's 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 very nicely balanced. But what I mentioned was not just the blog, but you made a comment about James Cheshire's uh, <laughs> cartogram of the usage of R, uh, mm -hmm. and, and w what I then said, sort of in educational purposes, is mm -hmm. that, that your point that uh, James uh, uh, misunderstood the representativeness mm -hmm. of the data he was using, and the, this mm -hmm. it, stru it struck me that when you're when you're reading a book like yours, then it's very helpful to know that the person who wrote it is a responsible scientist, mm -hmm. rather than a, someone who wants to th just as if, it, if it looks nice, it must be okay. And I don't, yeah. think, I don't <laughs> think that's your approach. I think your approach in your no. book as well is 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 to say that. Um, uh, even if it looks okay, it might be doubtful, so we better find out first. Mm -hmm. So the, and that, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's one of the basic things that the Geostat course tries to do, is to give people the, the, um, the um, critical view. Yeah. Critical view, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. And, but we also want My to leave an impression you. that we're a big community. We are we are a big community yeah. here. We're not we are competing somewhat, but we are also just no. trying to link yeah. link our we work. Are yeah. Okay, thank you so much for your webinar, and looking forward to seeing you uh, in physical life also. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It was a bye pleasure. Bye. bye. Okay, I just have to make a few announcements about yeah, tomorrow. Okay. Excuse me, uh, shall I? Uh, should we record the announcement? So it's no, 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 it's not. You can turn this off. Oh, it's a minute. Test, test, test.